Oh yes, Matthew, you have a request to share. Oh yeah, you got it. Thank you, Jared. Okay, let's try this one more time. I'm sorry. sorry. I will definitely have this figured out on Thursday. Um, last I said was that this thing on the left is for loco, otherwise commonly referred to as alcohol, although I would put quotations around the alcohol. I've smelled a lot of four loco flavored puke in my life. Um, this center, what category is Xanax in? Benzos. That's right. And then DXM on the right, what category is, what am I talking about? This is the depressant category. DXM or robo is cough syrup. Someone, I'm not sure if you're in here, actually sent me a very interesting introductory message about a, a wild experience with cough syrup. So I hope that you enjoy seeing this listed here. Um, depressants lead to decreased everything. The entire system is basically blunted. So your heart rate, your blood pressure go down, your level of cognition and attention. Your cognition doesn't necessarily go down per se, but your reaction time certainly does. I'm sure that this is something that many of you are familiar with. Um, obvious depression effects are amnesia, which can be acute or chronic loss of memory, and this depends on your use patterns. Um, reduced motor control, and there's an interesting thing that can happen in some cases here where chronic use of depressants can actually cause effects that mirror those that are seen in Parkinson's patients. So we'll return to that later, like a loss of motor control. We'll return to that later in exactly why that happens. As a sneak peek for that, depressants act effectively as pushing down on a spring. And the longer you push down on the spring for, if you release that pressure, spring goes way back up. And this can result in something called excitotoxicity, which is basically there's too much activity, too much firing happening in the brain, which can damage your neurons. So this is an effect that we're going to go into much greater detail with later. And this isn't necessarily the specific thing that is directly associated with Parkinson's, but it's an interesting thing to note this concept of pushing down on the spring. Um, and then sedation. This is probably the most significant part of the depressant effect is sedation. In fact, this can lead to frat boys passed out on a bus, among other um, titled phenomenon of alcohol and other depressant consumption. Alcohol is an unscheduled substance. It is frequently ingested by eating it. Oh, and I want to go back actually to something really quick. So right here, um, I love icons, which is why there are so many of them everywhere. You can probably see all the icons pertaining to routes of administration. And this is the stimulant icon up here. If you see this Adderall icon, it means something is categorized as a stimulant. But I want to point out the reason that I put all these routes of administration for caffeine. And the reason is that for most substances, you can put it into your body in really creative ways a lot of creative ways. You can put caffeine up your ass if you so desire. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to be the most bioavailable, a topic that we'll come into later. It doesn't mean that it's going to be very effective. And in some cases, it can be quite harmful to ingest a substance in a different way. Um, one kind of lighter example of this is 2CB, which often comes in powder form. And snorting 2CB is like putting several hot irons into your sinuses, and then you suffer. So it's not necessarily going I have a to. Question. Yes, go ahead. I don't know if this is the way to ask questions, so let me know if I'm doing it wrong. Go ahead and hop in. If if people have questions, you can go ahead and say them, or you can type them in the chat. And okay. if I need to like pause a second, I'll come back to you. But go ahead. Uh, it like there was something that looked like a band aid for the route of administration for caffeine. I was just trying to figure out what that white kind of thing in the middle. Yeah. That's suppository. So that's oh, okay. Thank you. Butt. That's all. Yes, yes, feel free to pop in with questions at any time. Um, right, so I just wanted to point that out. You can get alcohol in vapor form, for instance, ethanol can be vapor form. So this is something that's interesting to note here because there are so many ways that people do certain drugs like skin popping, for instance, is a route of administering cocaine wherein you inject it underneath your cutaneous layer, your skin. And this is a route of administration that is often employed by people that do not have access to veins, for instance, anymore. And it has its own unique set of risks and potential consequences. So this is a really good thing to know about beforehand. Then there's DXM, which is robo. It can come in NyQuil form or other form, pill or liquid. You can be prescribed it, et cetera. GHB, which is a schedule one substance, otherwise known as G. And there are several different varietals of this, like um, just B or GBL and 
a whole ton of different research chemical oriented versions. Then there are benzodiazepines. This there's, can come in more forms than just a pill necessarily, but most commonly you'll find benzos in pill form. And this is again, kind of a generalized scheduling, but benzos typically will fall under schedule four. Uh, examples of benzos include things like Valium and Xanax and Clonopin, and they are all in the depressant class. This is GHB right here. This is a dramatized version of what it looks like to drive under the influence of depressants that is in no way actually representative of what it looks like. Then there are inhalants. Inhalants are a class that is a little bit complicated to define initially because people often are like, is this thing an inhalant? And I'm like, well, do you inhale it? And they're like, no. <laughs> I'm like, well, it's, it's not an inhalant then. Like you could technically inhale Molly. They would probably be awful. <laughs> I don't want you to do that. It might dissolve in your lungs and cause pretty serious consequences actually, but you technically could inhale it. It just probably wouldn't do much for you. Uh, and then there's things like whippets, which is nitrous oxide or NOS, amyl nitrite, which is poppers. It can also be butyl nitrite. And then all kinds of other stuff. We got dust off and gasoline and hairspray and spray paint. So you can inhale a lot of different things. Now, the key factor about inhalants is that you don't heat or burn them. You can just inhale them into your lungs and they will have some kind of psychoactive effect. And that's really important to note because a lot of people will be like, is weed an inhalant? And the answer is no, you have to burn it to make it active. So there are a whole bunch of spectrums. If you're not muted, please mute yourself. Go ahead and check. Um, there are a whole bunch of different ways that inhalants can show up in product types. There are gases, often medical gases, but also things like propane, for instance. Solvents, which are things that vaporize at room temperature. So your Elmer's glue bottle sitting in your drawer can be huffed and often is actually like glue is a commonly thing that is huffed in particular by street children. Around the world, we're gonna do a whole segment on street children and huffing glue, which is a particularly prominent issue at this point in time, especially with whiteout correction fluid and similar things. Um, then there are aerosols, which have propellants in them. So they spray directly out and nitrites, which are relaxants. So uh, Febreze air freshener, for instance, is a nitrite and also poppers are nitrites as well. So inhalants are one of those categories where because the root of administration is inhaling them, the effects that are categorized as an inhalant are primarily associated with that practice of inhaling. If you're putting something into your lungs, it's going to get absorbed into your bloodstream really quickly, which means that most inhalants will come on in a couple of seconds and only last a couple of minutes. Now this is significant to know, right? Because often this can lead to compulsive redosing and can also lead in some cases to this phenomenon called sudden sniffing death. Now that's not to say that sudden sniffing death is, is a particularly common occurrence, but it can indeed happen. Please check to make sure you're muted. Otherwise I'm gonna have to come through and mute you. I love you anyway. So inhalants will often induce analgesia, pain relief and sedation as well. So as pictured person with uh, presumably nitrous oxide preparing to have their mouth mutilated by a dentist for science. And then there's also the risk of hypoxia in some cases, which is a loss of oxygen flow. You can see if someone has hypoxia because of blue tinting on their extremities, their fingertips, their toes, their nose, their lips. And this is an indicator that a person's blood circulation is not occurring effectively enough with oxygen in it. So this can happen with inhalants because a lot of people will try and hold it as long as possible. And if you're just holding it as long as possible once, you're probably just gonna pass out if you're not getting enough oxygen in that moment. However, if you are taking repeated doses of an inhalant over a period of time and getting very little oxygen each time on purpose, ultimately that will add up. And then there's the issue of frostbite. And frostbite is largely an issue of people discharging nitrous oxide cartridges without adequate protection. You can get frostbite on your face and on your hands if you're not using something to kind of act as a buffer between that released gas and your skin. It's fucking cold. You're releasing nitrous from this little metal charger. So there have been people that it's kind of like that, that effect of like you stick your tongue to a lamppost and then you pull away, but it's like your, your mouth. <laughs> So this, it's really important to use something like a balloon and also gloves if you're using a rooster, all things that we'll go over in greater detail, as I said later. Um, all of the popular inhalants are, 
unscheduled. Nitrous is, Nitrous hasn't been scheduled recently, has it? I would know about that one. Oh, you can buy Nitrous at, at sex shops. <laughs> I thought I saw someone in the chat saying that Nitrous was scheduled. Uh, yes, let me, let me mute. Thanks for pointing that out, sorry. Um, yeah, you can get Nitrous like everywhere. There are some places where you can't get it. Like in San Diego, they enacted kind of a, a limitation on what shops could sell Nitrous. Um, but you can get Nitrous quite easily. And it's often sold in sex shops and head shops, et cetera. Then there's amyl nitrite, which is also often sold in sex shops and head shops. Computer duster, which is sold at Best Buy. And then xylene, which is the active ingredient in glue and pens like Sharpies. And it's not always consistently xylene. That's just one example of how those things can manifest. The for food use caveat is what makes it virtually legal. Getting it from a gas supply company is near impossible. Exactly. If you want medical grade nitrous, you're going to need to go through a medical supplier. If you want uh, the kind of nitrous where you make whipped cream and spray it onto someone's titties, you can get it in a sex shop or a head shop or really anywhere like that's similar, honestly. I shouldn't say anywhere in general, but like similar places. What is most likely right here? Acid. Plus the... This one, yes, this one is labeled. What are these? Probably. Yeah, I think Mushrooms. the answer is... Mushroom. I don't know. Well, it's shrooms, but Peyote. like... Are we not supposed to know in this case? Oh, no. You, this, this isn't a test of your drug ID abilities. This is just kind of like, maybe it's this, and then it's probably going to actually be that in this case. But we'll get to that part later where we're going to play my favorite game called Name That Drug. It involves sparkly nugs and some fun music. Um, so we have LSD, psilocybin mushrooms. Up here we have salvia, salvia divinorum, the leaf extract. And then there's 2CB down there, peyote, mescaline, which is an extract from peyote, and DMT. And these are just some of the major psychedelics, right? But we're also going to take a little dabble, dip our little toes into 4HO and the similar families and like 4ACO DMT and 5MEO DMT and maybe 4HO MIPT. I'm not sure. I just work here. I'm not sure. We're going to get to so many different things. Now, the, the topic of hallucinogens, I have a strong feeling about how you refer to these substances because all too many people refer to hallucinogens as hallucinogenics. And hallucinogenic is an adjective. So I'm not trying to be a... a, a semantic nitpicker about this, but it is good to know that a drug can be hallucinogenic. That means it has hallucinogenic properties. Well, it is a hallucinogen as a noun. So it's not super important, but it's an interesting thing to know. At least I think that's interesting. So within this broad category of hallucinogens, there are dissociatives and delirians and classical psychedelics. So if something is a hallucinogen, it is um, perception altering substance, generally speaking. It makes you take in information differently than you did before and process it differently than you did before. In some cases, like LSD, this is more on the realm of like, I am thinking differently about these things, but I have like a link between myself and reality in some way. A lot of the time, not all the time. With dissociatives, it becomes a little bit more abstracted. Dissociatives are a very strange class of substance. And we're going to talk about them as their own class here because they're so wild. But it, it's worth noting that dissociatives, generally speaking, have elements of hallucinogens in them. Most dissociatives have hallucinogenic properties in some capacity. So that's good to know. And then there are delirians, and delirians are their own entire entity in a lot of ways. Um, let's see a show of thumbs. How many of you are familiar with Datura? Okay, a good number of you familiar with Datura. Diego, you're lying. I know you know what Datura is. Um, how many of you are familiar with scopolamine? Okay, 
All right, getting a little bit of drop off there. So we're going to take a, a little bit of a minor dive into things like Datura and scopolamine later. Um, Datura has interesting properties like the cigarette phenomenon where people think that they've dropped a cigarette and they will just like continuously go down to the ground and pick it up. And Datura can last like two days. So it's a really interesting one. It grows wild in a lot of areas. So it's good to know what it looks like and not accidentally pick it up and rub your hands all over it because it's this beautiful bell-shaped flower. It's very beautiful. It grows all over where I used to live. It grows in your backyard. Yep, they used to grow outside of my high school. Yeah, we used to joke about harvesting the seed pods and putting them in Miss Duncan's tea. We never did that. That's that's horrible. That's absolutely awful. It was funny to think about. So some hallucinogen effects include mydriasis. Say it if you're feeling participatory. Mydriasis. Say it to your keyboard. Yes, I see some of you saying it, and it brings me a level of joy that I can't verbalize. And then there's sensory alterations. The way that your brain and body process input is changed. We're going to go into grand detail with this later. We're going to do a whole section on trip sitting as well. So ways that you can support other people while they're having a psychedelic experience and prepare for your own in very, very specific concrete detail. I love that lecture. And then um, the potential for impact on mental health. And this is one that a lot of people have a lot of questions for me about. I get a ton, a ton of people contacting me every time I teach drugs go saying I'm on XYZ medication. I have XYZ mental health condition can or should I take psychedelics? Now I'll, I'll give a quick rundown of this. I have to make sure I'm not running, I am running out of time. So I'm not gonna give a quick rundown of this. I'll, I'll say like a sentence on it, which is basically conditions such as mood disorders or psychotic disorders can be brought out or exacerbated by stressors. Now what that stressor is, is dependent on the individual. We don't have a concrete measure of whether psychedelics are more or less prominent of a stressor than things like trauma or constant stress. We don't have that metric yet. What we do know is that you can take that information as informed consent and reduce the likelihood that if you choose to use psychedelics, you'll have a negative experience or a challenging experience by taking that information and applying it to how you plan your trip. So we'll come back to all that in greater detail, I promise. Popular hallucinogens include acid, which is a schedule one drug, psilocybin, schedule one drug, I keep holding up the wrong fingers, DMT, schedule one, mescaline, schedule one. And then over there is salvia, which is just unscheduled because salvia has the potential to induce a trip where you turn into a circus tent for three million years. And that is a direct anecdote from someone that I know. So all of these substances have very, very unique effects profiles. And when I say that thing about salvia, it should be noted that that's just one particularly funny example of how the salvia experience isn't one that a lot of casual psychonauts seek out. Um, people generally want to do salvia if they're really interested and okay with being pretty uncomfortable while they trip. A lot of people seek out psychedelics because they want to have their minds changed or blown. Spoiler alert. You can never go into a trip expecting to be changed. It's not going to work that way. Dissociatives, uh, these are just powders. I'm not going to ask you to try and ID them because that would defeat the purpose of reinforcing the concept of drug checking. Um, this on the left is ketamine, otherwise known as kitty or meow, which can be confusing because other things are known as meow too. This is PCP or angel dust. We will go over that. This is nitrous oxide, which yes, it's also an inhalant. That's the root of administration, but nitrous is a pretty prominent dissociative. Then we have MXE or mix. MXE has pretty much disappeared since 2016, but a few diehards can still get their hands on it. And then DXM. Now I wanna point out that we're starting to see some overlap here, some things that are reappearing in different categories. And don't worry, there are a shitload more drugs than just these. We're gonna go into a ton of them. These are just some of the most prominent ones or in the case of something like PCP, one of the most notorious ones. Ever heard of the rapper Big Lurch? Anyone familiar with that story? Thumbs up for Big Lurch? No? All right, cool. We're gonna talk about Big Lurch later in the case of cannibalism and PCP. And the fact that that was a sensationalized story that was in fact true, but also created a lot of stigma around PCP. Why am I so incapable of using Zoom? There's windows everywhere and I can't get rid of it. So dissociatives are 
I really need to get through this whole thing today. Dissociatives act as kind of a crossroads situation. They incorporate elements of dissociative, well, obviously, of hallucinogens, of depressants, of opioids, things like ketamine act on opioid receptors, um, and also can sometimes be inhalants as well. So generally the shared effect of the category is a sense of detachment between brain and body or body and environment and generalized feelings of pain relief. In some cases, sedation. In some cases, respiratory depression, slower breathing, but mostly pain relief and feelings of detachment. So this can manifest itself in the form of just like generalized dissociation, again, feeling detached from brain and body or body and environment, hallucinations in some cases, you can get visuals on things like ketamine and PCP. In some cases, this just disrupts your object processing. So like your sense of, of perception of reality could be warped or you could see something that would previously be obviously like that's a picture of a goldfish and your brain could be like, what is that? <laughs> I've never seen that before. And it's kind of just like a strange combination of these things. And of course, many dissociatives are currently being researched for profound mental health impact, specifically the alleviation of long-term chronic treatment resistant depression. We'll go deep into where that currently stands. Things are looking good. Some popular dissociatives include ketamine, which is a schedule three substance, PCP, which is a schedule two substance, much to many people's interest. And a little tidbit on that is that ketamine actually replaced PCP as being the prominent anesthetic in human medicine in the 60s. We'll come back to that later. PCP was still used to treat your animals because like, <laughs> why not, <laughs> right? And then MXE, which is also Schedule 2, and DXM, again, unscheduled. This is an example of SHRM, a PCP-dipped cigarette. Now, um, a lot of people have had a friend who smoked a joint at a party and freaked out and gone to the hospital, and they've been like, Rachel, 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 I think my friend overdosed on fentanyl, or I think that my friend smoked a PCP joint. The fact of the matter is that your friend probably didn't. Now, it's really uncommon for PCP dipped anything to be passed around anywhere. It can happen, but you take one hit of that, it's gonna taste like you're smoking a lawnmower. Like if you, if you don't taste that burning chemical, it's probably not PCP. And if your friend isn't unconscious, it's definitely not fentanyl. So I wanna point this out as a way that substances like PCP and fentanyl are kind of splashed. They're broadly applied. People are like, I don't know why this happened to me. It must be because of scary drug A or scary drug B. That's part of why this course I feel is so important because obviously it starts a moral panic if people are going around saying there's fentanyl in the weed at this college and also further demonizes not only the substances but the people that use them. Let's figure out how exactly they work. Opioids, this is an example of black tar heroin. It's a particular kind of heroin that is frequently imported from Mexico. Fentanyl, this is obviously a big one we're going to talk quite a bit about. This is methadone, which is one of the opioid replacement therapy substances that's available. Oxycodone or Percocet, otherwise known as Perks. And oxycodone is the generic name for the brand Percocet. We'll go into what that means later. And this is the opium poppy. This is where naturally occurring opium is scraped and harvested. And another fun tidbit we're going to get into later is how the opium trade partially funds the Taliban. Now, opioids versus opiates, this is an important, ah, I'm gonna go like four minutes over. You can feel free to leave if you need to, but I just was, wanna get through this whole thing today. So opioids versus opiates, this is a really easy way of telling if a news outlet knows anything about what they're reporting on. If a news outlet says, for instance, fentanyl is an opiate, they don't know what fentanyl actually is or what it's categorized as. Because anyone that spends time around opioids knows that opioid is the broad class of anything that binds to an opioid receptor in the brain. An opiate within that is a naturally occurring substance that is um, an alkaloid from the opium poppy plant. So an alkaloid, you don't really know, need to know what that is unless you want to. It's a substance that has nitrogen and has an effect on humans. The point here, is that an opioid includes synthetically created substances like fentanyl. An opiate within that is a specific kind of opioid that 
was created from opium derived materials. Does that make sense? Opioid big category includes synthetics. Opiate small category includes naturally derived from opium plant. So that's a good way of knowing whether your news source has done any research at all on what they're reporting on. And a lot of them haven't. Now, in the opposite to many other substances, specifically to stimulants and psychedelics, um, opioids will cause meiosis. If you're feeling participatory, meiosis on your side, meiosis. Yes, I see you, Desiree, and I see you, Jackson. I can't see anyone else, but I believe that all of you, every single one of you is saying meiosis right now. So meiosis is a pupil constriction effect. This is a good way of telling if someone could potentially be having an opioid-related overdose. I'll go in later to how you might be able to apply it. It's not foolproof, but it might help. Um, sedation is a major, major, major part of opioid effects, as well as this phenomenon that comes with it, nodding off or nodding out, which is nodding in and out of consciousness. And this comes with a whole lot of different things that we're going to go into more detail with later. Heroin is a schedule one substance that can be injected or smoked or snorted um, or eaten. Oxycodone is typically eaten or snorted, but you can also crush it and rail it or mainline it. Codeine, it's lean, it's the active ingredient in lean, is an opioid. And this is something that a lot of people who drink lean don't know, is that lean is an opioid. This is particularly dangerous when people combine it with alcohol in any way. This can lead to really serious respiratory depression, which can be fatal very quickly. And then there's methadone, which is a Schedule II opioid replacement therapy substance. Now onto the last bit. I'm sorry for being late. It's Zoom's fault, kind of. Cannabinoids. There are so many cannabinoids out there. We don't even know fully how many cannabinoids there are. There are at least 113 of them in the cannabis plant alone. And we'll go to that in a sec, what the distinction is. But some of the cannabinoids, I'm sure most of you have heard of, if not all of you have heard of CBD and THC, but there are tons and tons of others like THCV, T CBN, CBG, CBC, and all of them have kind of a unique effects profile, but only a couple of them actually have the potential to be psychoactive. THC is the main cannabinoid that's actually psychoactive that's naturally occurring. So for instance, just to make this clear, cannabinoids as a class can include synthetics. It's, they're referred to as synthetic cannabinoids, but synthetic cannabinoids were made in a lab to imitate generally, generally the effects of THC. So there's all cannabinoids as a larger category. And within that, there are naturally occurring cannabinoids in the weed plant. So the question, is cannabis a cannabinoid? No, because cannabis contains cannabinoids, a shitload of little chemicals that all work together using what's called the entourage effect, which is basically where a bunch of naturally occurring chemicals in a plant work together to create the effect. So it's not enough to just extract one thing to get the whole experience of the plant. And this is something we'll come back to with magic mushrooms as well. So there are three different general categorizations. There's endocannabinoids, found in the body. That's right. You have a natural weed system in your brain. <laughs> it's not actually that simple, but it's fun to think about. And then there's phytocannabinoids, which are found in plants, phyto meaning plant, and then synthetic cannabinoids, which are created in a lab. So examples of this might be spice or K2. It's a material that's usually sprayed onto plant matter or potpourri and then sold as actual weed. And this is what most people are probably actually having freakouts over when they think that they're ingesting PCP or fentanyl is either that they're just having a hard time on weed, which can happen to anyone, including experienced stoners. It's no big deal to admit that it's fine. Um, or it could be a synthetic. Now, synthetic cannabinoid, or I'm sorry, cannabinoid effects can include um, eating an entire cake when you're a Snoop Dogg. Um, that's generally appetite stimulation happens largely from THC, but it can happen from others as well. And then there's anti-anxiety effects from things like CBD, which can also act as a muscle relaxant. And then there's decreased reaction time from smoking weed. Yes, your reaction time is scientifically slower. No, you're not as good of a driver while you're high as you think you are. Please don't drive while you're baked, even if you have a really high tolerance. Um, we're going to rush through this. THC is schedule one. CBD is also schedule one. This is actually kind of a recent development. 
K2 and spice, some synthetics are regulated, some aren't. And then there's THCA among many others, but THCA is interesting because it's actually in the live cannabis plant, but it's not psychoactive unless you tweak it a little bit, but it's still schedule two. Yeah. All right, folks, thank you for bearing with me during that arduous Zooming situation. I will make sure to get that figured out for next time. Um, next time we're going to go into the concept of purity, which is a major, major thing that even the most seasoned drug users and experts fail to understand a lot of the time. And that's a really major one. I hope you, you're here for this one, as well as the basics of harm reduction and the not so basics of harm reduction, because it's more complicated than people think. And then we're also going to go a little bit into the beginnings of interactions and global legality. And then a little bit later, we'll get into the neuroscience stuff. So thank you so, so much for joining me. I hope to see you again on Thursday with fewer technical challenges. I'm going to comb through the chat for a second. So if there are any pressing questions, feel free to ask them. Remember that this is not affiliated directly with Dance Safe and that this is my personal hat on right now and not my Dance Safe hat on. So please feel free to email me with any questions. Have a fantastic inauguration night tomorrow night. I hope that all of you have bought at least one bottle of champagne and that you're not drinking it to yourself because that will dehydrate you. So have a great time and I will see you guys on Thursday. I'm just gonna read through the chat real quick. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. You guys have a fantastic Thank day. you. Have a good one. In response to the question about THCA and Delta 9, um, yes, it's a decarboxylation thing. So THCA is not active unless you burn it, basically. I'm gonna stay after class like a nerd. <laughs> yeah, I uh, definitely want to add something in this time about Delta THC because a lot of people have asked me about it this year in particular, or Delta-8 THC in particular, because you can purchase it legally in so many areas. I wanna throw in something about 1P LSD. Um, Matt, what was that that peptide that you talked about during- oh, those, those are a fair bit more obscure, but uh, BPC-157 uh, was that peptide. Oh, I mean, definitely more obscure, but I still wanna write it down. Yeah, they're into like, it's more so like performance enhancing uh, type drugs. What like, is the, the mechanism of that one? Uh, we don't know. We only have rat studies. Um, <laughs> but it supposedly uh, increases like concentration of growth hormone at certain areas. And um, the reason I was taking it was because it was been, it's been shown in rats to reverse um, amphetamine-induced brain damage um, and like attenuate it like while someone is on amphetamine or while a rat is on amphetamine. Um, and uh, I was like kind of down in the dumps after taking amphetamine for like five years straight. And so uh, prescribed and um, <laughs> I uh, gave it a shot and um, it actually uh, helped me not be tired all the time and like kind of feel like myself again, weirdly enough. Um, but yeah, it, it was a weird trial. Uh, it's also used for like tendonitis, like people like people in like bodybuilding and like biohacking forums will use it for like tendon issues. They'll inject it like subcutaneously near um, where like the injury is. It's called BPC-157. <laughs> I love that. I wish that I could like be in charge of naming stuff so I could just name something Sharknado and call it a day. You guys get a hit of that Sharknado last week. It, it, <laughs> um, uh, it stands for body protective compound, which is kind of like almost like gimmicky. It's strange. Um, Sweden, does Molly cause memory loss? This is a really interesting question. We're going to come back to this definitely during the MDMA spotlight because we're going to do a whole segment just on Molly because there's so much to know about Molly. Like, damn, it's one of my favorites to talk about because it's just like amazing. Um, the answer is it depends, which is so frustrating. And I hate it when people answer my questions with it depends, but I'll tell you how and why it depends. Generally speaking, the most important things that determine potential long-term consequences of doing something like Molly are your dosage, your frequency of use, your medication interactions, if any, pre-existing conditions, and the temperature of your environment actually is very important. Obviously, there's... John, did you just arrive? Oh, no, I'm so sorry. I thought... This is a... No, no. <laughs> I thought that you were John Chow, who was like in, in class last time. Um, so the, the issue is that 
there are a lot of different factors that can play into whether or not MDMA can cause long-term consequences. If you're taking it on a relatively irregular basis and you're taking it at doses that do not exceed, I would say 250 milligrams at most. If you're taking more than two and a half points of Molly, you are in general danger zone, honestly. Um, and that's like, like, I use the phrase danger zone pretty loosely because technically danger is a word that I like to avoid really, but your risk for incurring something like memory loss is existent if you're dosing high, high doses at frequent intervals. And the reason for this is that the phenomenon is generally called brain zaps when it comes to something like Molly. Um, this usually would happen more acutely, like soon after you roll but if you're not giving yourself enough time between rolls, this effect can kind of roll over and people can start to feel generally a little bit brain foggy, a little bit detached. Um, I don't know the exact reason that this would happen. I think that the mechanism of action would probably have something to do with general dysregulation of your serotonin system. And that can happen when you are experiencing cell death. I mean, like, Again, this is really general information. We're gonna go into what cell death actually looks like because it's not like the brain of your cells die, it's that their tails die. <laughs> and I can't explain that without doing the neuroscience segment. Um, brain zaps occur from other substances like psilocybin or LSD? Probably not. Um, what could happen is if you have a psychologically challenging experience from a psychedelic like psilocybin or LSD, it's possible that the resultant kind of dissociation or trauma impact could cause those kinds of effects, like your ability to interface with your environment could be decreased over time. Um, SSRI withdrawal can also definitely cause brain zaps. And that's a pretty serious one that people don't talk about. If you've been taking SSRIs for a minute and you stop taking them without tapering, especially without guidance from someone, you are definitely prone to experiencing debilitating withdrawal symptoms. This is no joke. They usually only last like two or three weeks. Maybe they can last a little longer, but a lot of time, a lot of the time people aren't aware of the potential for that. There can be a lot of compl complications and consequences. So when you um, say like enough time between dosages, would that be like a month in terms of Molly? A month? Yeah. I advise not taking Molly more than two or three times a year. Okay, so this uh, this person's... The thing is like... More than that. <laughs> a lot of people take Molly more often than that. A lot of people. And people like Anne Shulgin, for instance, who was the wife of one of the most famous um, chemists of all time in drug history and education, um, took it every weekend for many years. And the thing is that that's a really unusual outlier case. And it was usually like low dosages and she ultimately ended up having a heart problem which could be caused by it as well. Um, but I would say that if you want, also we have less than a minute before Zoom is going to kick us all out. I lied. I didn't get it fixed. Generally speaking, I recommend more than no more than two or three times a year if you want to have the even possibility of being able to roll consistently throughout your life. Otherwise, if you're rolling like every month or two or even every two to three months, you got like five years. Honestly, not for everyone, but for most people, you have like a cutoff time. You need to allow more time than that because your system can't be constantly regulating. It will get stingier with its serotonin production and release over time. Um, I'm going to end this because we're literally about to get kicked out. So nice to see all of you guys afterwards. <laughs> and you. I will hopefully see you on Thursday. Feel free to message me with any questions. Bye, guys.